So we are heading deeper through the Great Crystal Citadel thing, or whatever the hell this is supposed to be. And, well, what do we have here? Wraiths! Now, we had seen these things before inside of the Phoenix Gate. The majority of the enemies that we saw in that area were sort of robotic constructs, leftovers of an ancient civilization which is long gone. The Wraiths, on the other hand, were something else. They're probably related in some way, but they are definitely something else. And seeing them here, well, that implies something else, I figure. How could those creatures from Phoenix Gate be here in the mines? Are the two places connected somehow? Of course the two places are connected somehow. We're talking about magic here. And inside of this world, the magic that... The hell was that? The magic... <laughs> I'll ignore a noise I just heard in the distance. Um, magic is the product of these crystals, and it's also the product of the environment. The ether is in the environment, and the crystals draw it out. Now, just because that's how crystals work, that doesn't mean that's not also how things like um, the dominance and the bearers work. So the Phoenix Gate was sort of like the connection that the dominant of the Phoenix had with this sort of magical source or way of convening with the spirits or some shit like that. I don't know. And we have a giant crystal. They're both tapping into the same power as far as I can tell. So it's really no wonder that you're going to find some kind of a connection between the Phoenix Gate and this great crystal. Now, what the nature of these wraiths are, now that's the question I don't have an answer for. They're, I mean, a wraith is a kind of a ghost. So, are they spirits of dead people? Perhaps these are the spirits of the ancient civilization that built the constructs inside the Phoenix Gate. Maybe it's their... Maybe maybe we got a sort of a Final Fantasy VII kind of thing going, the, the spirit energy kind of thing, where in that game you had the uh, Mako, which was a spirit energy life stream, and when a person or an animal or a tree or something like that died, that spirit energy would be returned to the planet, and with it would come the knowledge of that person or thing's experiences. And that was what fueled the planet. It's what made the planet go. It became the blood of the planet. And the more people died, the more people lived, experienced, and then died, the stronger the planet would grow. Perhaps the ether is something similar, where it's built out of the deceased souls of the people that have come before. So these are the ghosts of the ether, in a sense. Ether is made out of ghosts. The ghosts can take this form, so that's what we're seeing here. And of course, a lot of the ether is going to be accumulating around the crystals because it's sucking so much of it up. So that's why we're seeing so many of these things just sort of appear here. And inside the Phoenix Gate as well, because, you know, a lot of power is there as well. So maybe, maybe all speculation here, that the race we're seeing are the ghosts of the ancient civilization that built the robots inside the Phoenix Gate, that built the airships that we're seeing littered across the ground, that built the old structures like where the hideout is located. And that... I don't know, maybe... That, that sounds plausible, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, given that this game came out quite a number of months ago, and I'm still crawling my way through it, <laughs> I'm sure that a lot of the people watching this video are aware of what the story goes, where of the nature here, and they're probably shouting at their phone or their screen or the TV or their computer or something right now, going, like, no, you fucking moron! It's, um... I don't know, whatever the hell else it would be. <laughs> I have had a problem with sticking to this game. It's a problem that I've had over the past several years. I've been doing this YouTube thing for about 12 years with this channel. So a long, long, long time. And yes, I know I will never be a success here. 
but there have been many a times when I have sort of fallen off of it and failed to produce anything for a while, or I start a game like Final Fantasy IX was one that I'd started and it took me forever to complete. In this case, it's different, because I'm playing through this blind, whereas Final Fantasy IX is a game that I'd played before. So I wasn't, like, experiencing the story for the first time, and I got a cutscene coming up, so I'm going to have to go quiet for a minute. When I was in the Imperial Army, soldiers assigned to the Glass Gate would tell stories about something they call the Guardian. Can't say I saw anything like that when I was last here. Then again, I can't say I made it this far. Let's just be careful, then. <sighs> Where did that come from? Yes. Poor beast. Another victim of the flood. Well, if it's a fight, all right, we got a boss battle, a dragon, which is or. I guess it's not a dragon if it's got four legs like that, plus wings. What would they they call that, like a wyvern or something? I don't know. I, this weird fantasy crap, I can't, I can't keep it straight. But anyway, unlike when I got stalled out while playing Final Fantasy IX, in this case it was a little bit different because I, in that I just sort of got a lost interest in supporting the channel for a little while. When it came to this game, it, I was experiencing the story for the first time. The problem was, though, it came out... The game came out during a very stacked year in terms of game releases. 2023. Oh, my freaking God. We've had slim years. We've had good years. But holy shit, there were so many great games that came out in 2023 that, honestly, I haven't even managed to get to all the ones to even try them that I wanted to. So you had this game came out. And it didn't have a chance of ever winning Game of the Year, though it is pretty damn good, I think. But it came out the same year as freaking Baldur's Gate 3, which is something that drew my attention away when it came out. Because that game is freaking phenomenal. I'm one of those people that happen to love it. It also came out the same year as, like, uh, Tears of the Kingdom, Legend of Zelda game. There's also, which, like, I don't own a Switch, because I'll probably never end up using it. But I might get a Switch just to play that. Uh, there's also a Mario game I don't really give a shit about that people seem to like. But, I mean, there was an Armored Core game. Uh, Armored Core 5, I think it is. Which, I was a big fan of Armored Core back in the PlayStation 1 days. Fell off of 2, but it seems like, hey, you know what? FromSoft has gotten their shit together. Producing great games. I mean, Elden Ring, my freaking game of the year for 2022. So it's like, oh, all these other stuff. But Baldur's Gate 3, that just drew me straight away from this. There's also the fact that City Skylines 2 came out, that drew my attention for a little while. Resident Evil 4 Remake, that drew my attention for a while. There's just too many damn things. And, and fuck, even Starfield. You know, a lot of people have a lot of shit to say about Starfield, and I, I say there's a lot of stuff that I agree about that, the criticisms people have for it. But I still found something to enjoy with that. So, you know what, I should make a video about Starfield, about my opinions of it. Not, um... Not like a full playthrough or anything like that, but just a short thing. But anyway, I just kept getting pulled away from this, and you know how these very story-heavy games go. If you if you get pulled away, you have a hard time coming back. If you're away for more than like three weeks or so, there's like a 5% chance you're getting back to that game. So, I... <laughs> had forgotten so much of the shit that had happened in the game because I just stopped playing it for quite a while that in order to prepare myself to get back into this game 
I had to actually sit and watch my own videos. I watched my own videos. Oh my god, the vanity. <laughs> just to... <laughs> just to remember what happened. And now, I, now I'm here. It's... I'm not sure when this is going to be uploaded, but it is February 13th. And I realize, holy shit... Um, 16 days until Final Fantasy VII Rebirth comes out, which is <laughs> another one I, I pre-ordered, in fact, and I um, I would very much like to play that. <laughs> so, am I going to be able to get through this game in 16 days? Am I going to be able to get through this as well as um, all the other shit? Like, I got to put everything else down. I gotta stop playing Starfield. I gotta stop playing Baldur's Gate. I gotta stop. Uh, I gotta put aside my intention of ever playing uh, freaking um, Armored Core, and just stick with this. And like, it's a good game too. It's just there's so much other stuff. But anyway, um, I should do a the demos out for Seven Rebirth. I should. Jeez, I'm getting distracted again. Yeah, the demo's out for Rebirth. I should go and make a video for that. <laughs> like I did for this. The first episode of this playthrough, or the first two episodes, I guess, were... Um, well, perhaps the first few. I'm not sure how many there were. Were of the demo, and the demo of Rebirth, much like the demo for 16, is the first, um, first couple hours of the game. You know what? I played through seven. Not, since this boss battle is going to go on for a little while, I'll, I'll just get to add some comments about seven rebirth. I played through that, and then, like it's more of re uh, seven remake the way that it plays. They did add some extra stuff like a cloud canal vault over things, which is something that felt like it was missing in the original. It doesn't change a whole hell of a lot, but it is something like it makes you feel like. You're less occupy. You're occupying a world and not like in a picture. You know. Uh, it's way it portrayed Sephiroth, though. Like he was in. You saw this flashback scene that the demo takes place in, the Nibelheim flashback in the original game. But it honestly wasn't that long, and you didn't get so many lines of dialogue out of Sephiroth that you got the impression that he was a like a human. He felt a little bit cold all the time. But in the remake, they, or uh, Rebirth, they have gone and done quite a bit to, like, give him a little bit of heart to make it seem like he's more of a person. You spend a lot more time with him in this demo than you did in the flashback of the original game. So, there's that. But there is something that I want to say. I don't know if this is nitpicking too much, but the game does have a little bit of a fidelity issue in terms of graphics because it does I mean it does it looks good it looks fine and I'm well, the past several years I've been a proponent of developers needing to calm the fuck down on trying to push the boundaries and graphics all the time so it looks fine but after right after playing the demo I jumped back into this to record the footage for this episode and I realized like, 16 looks so much better but you know 7 looks fine but I guess, is, is Rebirth a cross-generation game? Is there a PS4 version? There might be a PS4 version of it. And that's probably the cause. Like, there was the original 7 remake. The original 7 remake, that's weird oxymoron. <laughs> there was <laughs> the 7 remake, which was a PS4 game. And of course, there was a PS5 and PC version. But you have the original assets, which... I would say they're probably either using over again in this game, or they just ran them through the system and, like, updated them a little bit. Like, you could see in the game, like, the characters have a little, little bit of hair on their face. Like, just the little wispy bit of hair on their nose or something like that that you definitely didn't see in the original game. But, you know, it's a, still a cross-platform game, I think, so that's going to limit it. Plus, I think it's... These games were also on a little bit of a limited budget compared to, like, 16, which was the big AAA release of its year, you know?
Are you all right? Fine. The inner sanctum lies just beyond. Chances are the palace guard knows we're here. We should move. Not that any sane commander would send his men into a place awash with this much ether. Clive. Hmm. If this all works and the blessing fades, things are likely to get worse for our kind before they get better. Being the last to wield ether will make our talents that much more sought after. By which I mean hunted. I just hope in the end they'll see that we didn't have any other choice. That it was the only way to get us to a better place. And here I was thinking I was the uncertain one. Luckily, two out of three of us have faith in you. Then it all starts here. Time to earn that menacing title. Sid the Vicious, was it? Alright, so the episode's over. Before I move on, I just want to point out that, yeah, both... It, it definitely does the use of magic take something out of both a bearer and, and, and a dominant. Because we see both Jill and... Sid are affected by the fact that they had to go through this fight. Whereas Clive, he seems to be all right right now. Maybe there is something different about him. But Sid, he looks like he's in pain. And Jill looked like she was worn herself out in that fight. And it's probably not just from the fighting itself. It's the use of the magic.